Karanga mai te wharetua, tongariro, kā hui maunga, te maira, tauhara, te puku o tika, te mano o tika, te heu heu, pōtatau, te whero whero, ngā wai tapu, ngā wai ariki, ngā wai Māori, tēnā tātou. I tautoko au ngā mihi, kua mihia, huri noa ki a tātou e whakarawika nei runga i te karanga o te wai Māori, tēnā tātou. Ko pia pōhatu ahau, ko Ngāti Parau, me ngā iwi o Tūranga Nui Ākiwa, tai atu ki Ngāti Kahunga ni te Tewairoa, oku iwi. Kia ora tātou, ko Kate Walker toku ingoa, he uri o Ngāti Parau, te whakatohea, te whanau apanui, ngā i tūhoi, ngā te whakau e rau ko me ngā i te rangi, e whakatipu, māma ko pia, i raro e te maru o Hukurangi Maunga. Kia ora. So, mai apu ko kā huhua he kororo tēnei no te kainga. Traditionally, and provides an insight actually into Ngāti Prao leadership traditions, me ki. And traditionally references the female leadership within the Waiapu Valley. And so, I've got another slide coming up. There's about 28 marae or 25-ish hapu within the greater Waiapu River catchment and ko te nuinga o rātau nō ngā wahine rangatira. But in more recent times, we... Sorry, tauho to this technology. Aiwi. Yeah, we talk about Waiapu kōkā huhua to remind us as kaitiaki to return her to her abundance, her and her tributaries that were able to sustain 25 plus hapu. Um, one of my demography stats is today there's only about two and a half thousand Ngāti living in the Waiapu. Most of Ngāti probably lives ki wahi ke. Um, so she's not in a good state. Um, and so, yeah, for us to operate and leverage from um, positions of abundance. So Miss Kate and I wanted to share what we think hopefully will be beneficial to you all. Um, I'll cover the first two, enabling hapu leadership and the way we've gone about determining te mana o te wai so far. All of this is work in progress. And um, Miss Kate focuses on how we've approached this FMU, um, Tina introduced it, we preferred to use Takiwa to follow our mana whakahaere, our, our senses of mana whakahaere, um, and how we're trying to translate that technical process, process in the um, NPS. And, and just before we get to those, just give you a bit of context. Um, we tahi o koutou, kare koutou mohi o keifia tēnei awa o, o waiapu. Um, so we're in the Gisborne district. Uh, the Waiapu is the second largest catchment. Uh, the the colourful um, map in the middle there um, is the tributaries that make up the Waiapu. So the five main um, tributaries are the Mata, Tapuairo, Mangapuro, Porupuro, and Maraihara rivers. But the Waiapu River itself herself actually forms at the confluence of the Mata and Tapuairoa just inland from Ruatoria. Tapuairoa and Mata originate in Ngā Pai Maunga o Te Raukumara. And in terms of the Mata, the Mata actually starts uh, from a puna called Taumarere inland of Tolaga Bay, about 45 minutes drive south from, from Ruatoria. Flows north, northeast and um, enters Te Mona Nuiākiwa at the Ngutuawai Rangitukia. Uh, the other maps are, are uh, to show you how our marae are situated within Ngāti Parau, Mai Pōtukirua, ki te toka Taio. So there's about 50 marae in Ngāti Parau and The Waiapu, the Waiapu catchment sort of involves these marae with their respective Pakiwa. 
Hapu territories. Um, and when we when we went to settlement in 2012, we actually changed certain things. Um, we've collectivised as hapu. You'll hear Kate and I refer to them as rohinga tipuna. Um, yeah, it's kind of multi-layered meki. And those relate to our coastline, so how we access our moana on that, on that part. The gaps you see are those of us who didn't agree to these certain things, so didn't join in, so they're not on that map. Um, but, but, you know, we are all still there and, and not there. Um, so those rohinga tepuna are how we uh, elect our representatives to Te Runanganui on Ātipuro. So there's some significant political influence influences there, but in a tile space, oh, you know, and it's signi significant in the tile space too, in terms of the Kaitiaki Takutai Kaitiaki Trust set up as the legal entities within our Ngārohe Moana o Ngāhapu o Ngātipro deed of agreement and, and act. So there's all these multiple layers that in talking about enabling hapu leadership, we're trying to leverage off what's been spoken before, whakapapa, mana, customary authority, how we arrange ourselves, working with the ways we arrange ourselves, and it gets a bit hard when we start interfacing with these legal constructs that are being put in place to support our, our um, mana whakahaere. But so, it, it's already been said, you know, earlier today, it's a mana conversation. Me pē hea tātou te whakatutuki to tātou mana whakahaere. Um, those are whakatauki and whakatauaki that, that we've defaulted to, actually, to whakahaere us and working out um, how we're going to approach te mana o te wai. So the first one, uh, Te Otaki mentioned, oh, yeah, expressed when he first met Tu Whakairiora, and the second one, um, behold Te Rangi Tawaia in your chief legal garment. So every time our maunga is in snow, he tohu, and we're reminded to, you know, get on with it, get on with the job of the things we've got to do. And also, it's very confusing, I think, Ruby, you spoke about it, the rule of the tail and the rule of decision-making in those systems, we can get confused and default to thinking, oh, we haven't got the skills or the whatevers to, to kick it against council or whoever. But we actually have to always remind ourselves, go back to your traditions, your understandings of your mana, your leadership, customary authority, customary title, if you still have it, um, and go and go from there. Um, these principles, we call them, we just short, um, nickname them the, the Toy Two principles. Those convey that customary authority, mana, leadership, kōrero that's been handed down to us. And those are now enshrined in our Ngārohe Moana Act. Um, and so in the tile space, we are, we're trying to really embed those. So they'll become principles that guide us, but also ways of behaving, ways of doing, and even measures of how we'll monitor how well or, or, or not well that, that we've done in this, in this new interface, I suppose, that we find ourselves in. And in terms of te mano o te wai, we were fortunate to, that, that case study that Tina um, introduced we were able to convene a wānanga āhapu, uh, which gave us these gems, really. So we've got um, the whanaunga tīnangata calling us to court. Um, mana is intrinsically linked with and determined through whakapapa. Who can whakapapa to wai to uphold mana? The first two principles in te mano te wai are, are, are clear as to who who has the whakapapa relationship? That is already established. The third tier um, 
allocation in terms of use and development, that does not align well with mana, and that's going to be a real crunch, um, a crunch um, time for us. So that that really um, committed us to, and it's been said earlier today, we need to invest or not take for granted our relationship with our way. So he taonga tukuiho, and to make sure that we're still instilling all those things in our children with our mokopuna also. Um, and then it made us ask, what does a whakapapa approach, and how does that better guide us in our participation in freshwater management? Um, what do whakapapa-based objectives, rules, policies, limits look like? And what do whakapapa-based um, monitoring regimes look, look like? So I'm going to hand it to Miss Kate now, because she'll, we've actually tried to start making gains on those questions we asked of ourselves um, about 12, 14 months ago. Kapai, so following on to Pia's context, so a little bit further from the background um, information Pia provided, so the Waipu catchment um, is on a global scale um, suffers some pretty serious erosion. Um, it's estimated that every year there is 25 to 36 million tonnes of suspended sediment moving through the Waipu catchment and out into our Takutai Moana. Um, so prior to the strengthening of Te Manoa Te Wai in 2020, um, we had a series of provisions um, originating from our treaty settlement um, to manage whenua and wai within the Waiapu catchment, starting off with the Waiapu Accord, um, which is a memorandum of understanding between um, the Crown, Trump, uh, Te Runanganui on Atipro and Gisborne District Council. Um, out of the Waiapu Accord um, was the Waiapu Kokahuwa um, restoration project, so that um, is a 100-year commitment um, between the uh, three parties to restore uh, the Waipu catchment. And following on from that, um, we now have a joint management agreement with uh, Gisborne District Council, which I'll touch on further. Um, the overall vision or the desired outcome of the Waipu Koka Huhua project is Kote Mana, Kote Hauara o Te Whenua, Kote Hauara o Nga Awa, Kote Hauara o Te Iwi. Healthy land, healthy rivers, and healthy people. So, following on from the establishment of the Waipukoka Huha project, we um, now have the joint management agreement with Gisborne District Council, which was signed in 2015. Um, this was signed uh, to, to deal with the rest, to, to enhance the restoration um, efforts, but also it came to fruition when when um, Gisborne District Council was developing the Gisborne Freshwater Plan, and Ngāti Pirau signalled that we did not want to have the same management regime as the rest of Tūranga because we have a very different um, geography in Ngāti Pirau and we also have a very different cultural landscape. So there are multiple um, joint decision-making uh, provisions within our joint management agreement. The main one is the co-development of the Waipu catchment plan, so that is to um, develop a bespoke land and freshwater plan to manage our catchment from the mountains to the sea. So the... Joint management agreement was signed in 2015 and we've been talking about this Waipu catchment plan for a wee while um, and we've, we're, now we've got that deadline of 2024 under the um, MPSFM. This is an overview of our project team. So we've, the Waipu catchment plan is largely developed, will be largely developed based off a um, the input of a panel of hapu technicians. So our hapu technicians panel, we have representation from each of the Rohinga Tipuna within the Waipu catchment plan. So in Ngāti Pirau, we have seven Rohinga Tipuna to, um, from Pōtikirua ki te Tōkā Tāo. The Waipu catchment 
spreads across five of those seven Rohinga Tipuna. We also have a technical support team who is the interface between our hapu technicians and, um, and the project team to ensure that hapu aspirations and challenges are um, worked through to find real life solutions within the Waipu catchment plan. Um, a lot of our mahi to date has, um, particularly with the input of the technical support team, is working with us as a project team and, and the whānau to understand the statutory planning processes before we could even understand how to integrate our Ngāti Pro world view. So we wanted, we want to think from abundance, we don't want to be limited by what are the minimum statutory requirements? We want those to work for us and not the other way around. Um, this is a general scope of our project team. Um, we do have a big team, but we do have a big scope because we are trying to write a bespoke plan that manages freshwater and whenua um, in a catchment that has significant issues. Um, for every point, uh, for every point, we typically have two to three layers of complexity un under these um, under these points, and we try to interweave hapu aspirations, the statutory requirements, and the capacity and capability gaps under each of these different topics. Also, there are, although we have a big team, we've found that. Um, you know, cap capacity and capability has always been an issue. Um, we've, and up until recently, we, we've had no funding and we've done a lot of this mahi um, voluntarily. Now we have some, some funding, we can pay our whānau, but um, they're all really busy because they're all doing really good stuff. So that is, that is another, um, uh, an, another struggle that we have, um, although we have some funding, we're still struggling to um, deal with capacity issues. Um, so I'll just touch over some of the policy, um, how we've tried to navigate through the policy. I won't go um, too in depth because it does get a little bit boring, but this is what we're, like I said, like we're, an, over the past, kind of, well, since the MPSFM came out in 2020, we've, up until now, we've really been struggling to get our heads around the process, mainly because it deconstructs the way we typically relate to our way and our whenua. Um, and we've tried to come up, well, to get our heads around what is the process and how can we have a mana-enhancing catchment plan process. Um, and this is just an example of the, what we've done with the National Objectives Framework. Um, I think it's actually, it's an eight-step eight um, process, but we've combined, we've combined a few of them because we've, we've struggled to do one step and move to, to the next step because it's, our world is not a linear world. We live in a multi-dimensional world, and so we've struggled to follow one step at a time because We've jumped back and forth many a times. But essentially what this is describing is that in every single point there needs to be whakapapa based management. So I'll just do a little bit of overview of where we're at at the moment. So we've... Um, we are in this space, so this is actually, it's two, two steps on my diagram, but it would be four steps within in the, um, in the NOF. But we've found that we have been working in, uh, on these steps kind of in parallel because we can't, def we've found that each step feeds back into the original step and so we've, we've been working on them um, at the same time. But this is the space where we're working and we just want to make sure that we get them right before we move on to the rest of the steps. Um, I guess another comment as to why we've kind of, another comment as to why we've kind of, not necessarily, 
not not struck we struggled to finish one step at a time is that when we're engaging with our Fano, it's typically over a lot of different kopapa because there are a lot of things going on and we are we do need to maximize our time with our Fano and it is always it's always the same people engaging anyway. So this so we just when we hold a hui they tell us all their whakaaro and their kōrero and then we come back and try and figure out how to incorporate it in here. Um, and because we don't want to limit their thinking because that's where all the power is and we don't want to limit it by the stink statutory requirements. Just an example of um, kind of our approach to, to this mahi, so we've got the long, so you have to identify a long-term vision. Naturally, we would, it's an 100 year long term vision. So, the Wai Pukokwa Huhua vision is healthy land, healthy rivers, healthy people. That would be a, a natural fit for us, but I guess we're, we've found that the, that is too broad for the requirements of the NPSFM. It needs to be measurable and also it's open to interpretation. So, we are working to figure out. How do we, um, if that is the overall vision, how do we word it in a way that healthy land, healthy rivers, healthy people is interweaving all of these different values that are um, that make up our world? Um, so FMU. So this is prop this is kind of the main example where we've, we're testing what does whakapapa based management look like um, in the Waipu catchment plan and, and just giving effect to te mano o te wai um, typically. So typically FMUs are set at a catchment based level or um, based on management issues or biophysical um, characteristics. That's cool, we recognise that that is important, but for us, the priority is to make sure that the FMUs provide for our relationship and whakapapa to why. And so, because we, we are co-developing the plan with Gisborne District Council, I guess there is a bit more flexibility for us to do this, but under the, under the NPSFM, tangata whenua should be included um, in freshwater management to the extent that they wish to, so this is, this should definitely be on the table for people. So we are looking at, we're currently exploring FMU options aligning with our rohinga tipuna um, within the catchment. Uh, this is our preferred option, but I guess we are worried about, like if we take into account connectivity um, within the, um, within the the catchment, then another option would be one FMU, but with different management zones aligning with the Rohinga Tipuna. Um, also because when we take into account the mountains to sea approach, we, our Rohinga Tipuna don't just cover our whenua, it also extends out to the Takutai. So that's why our, that's our preferred option to freshwater management units. Um, and just quickly, because we're running out of time, um, I guess just to touch on what we see, what I said previously, we have um, we have struggled to pinpoint the whakaaro and um, the values that our people have identified. We've we've been talking about our values for quite some time. Our people are comfortable with their values, but they don't. Um, they don't. Um, they are not consistent with the values identified in the MPSFM. So we're spending a lot of time trying to articulate our values that are in the context that is consistent with both the Ngāti Pro world view and the MPSFM. We don't. Um, we're trying to avoid having the compulsory MPSFM values. Um, with the typical explanations that you would have around that and having the Māori values to the side um, because it's easy for those to just get pushed to the side. So we're trying to come up with a way to intertwine our, our, our world view within every single aspect of the NPSFM um, and making sure that we're capturing the biophysical um, 
biophysical, cultural and spiritual relationship um, between every aspect of our tile from, from the mountains to the sea. Um, we've had a bit of pressure from, from council kind of outlining why does it take so long for you to tell us our value, tell them our values. Um, that's pretty common across, uh, across um, the motu, I would assume. Um, and it's not that we don't know our values, because we do. It's that um, putting them into Pākehā words really limits the different layers of complexity to that. And I guess um, a common example um, is, is swimming. Yeah, we all love swimming, that's great, but it's not just because we just like to go swimming because it's hot, it's, it's, you know, it's a way to connect with our awa, it's a way to connect to our whakapapa, um, and that needs to be captured in, um, appropriately, and not that we just like to go swimming, and that that's a recreational value that we have. Um, so these are just some things that we are um, navigating through at the moment. Um, it's been a long time coming for us to get to the table. I guess we just wanted to provide some insight into now that we're at the table, these are the things that we are, are, are dealing with at the moment. And. And now, also, now that we're at the table, we have the RMA reform, um, which is, we're, you know, we're not completely opposed to the RM reform. We, you know, the RMA hasn't necessarily worked the best for us, but Cabinet has intended to uphold treaty settlements and the resource management agreements, such as our JMA. The, the, our JMA gives us quite some pretty strong and unique joint decision-making provisions um, that are threatened in, in the RMA just by the fact of RMA reform, just by the fact that the the decision making powers will be transferred to new um, to new entities. Um, it's not a it's not a like for like transition. So not only are we trying to navigate how do we um, how do we make our world work with the statutory well, how do we combine how do we implement the Waipu catchment plan now, but how also how do we design and implement the catchment plan, taking um, having cognizance of, of the vast reforms as well. So that was a really condensed version. I, I, should, I skipped through a couple of slides because the time has been on red for 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> but kia ora. Thank you.